Welcome to episode 95 of Stageworthy. I'm your host, Phil Rickaby. Stageworthy is a podcast about Canadian theatre makers, featuring conversations with actors, directors, playwrights, and more. If you're new to Stageworthy, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please consider leaving a comment or rating. Your ratings and comments help new people find the podcast. My guests are Ellie Moon and Brendan Healy. They joined me to talk about Ellie's play, Asking For It, presented with Crow's Theatre, Nightwood Theatre, and Necessary Angel Theatre Company at the Streetcar Crow's Nest, starting October 5th, 2017. living rooms with a with a microphone or? I mean all over it yeah. was kind of like um, most of the time it would be like we were already hanging out and then yeah. I would bring up the play and then I would say so how do you feel if I record mm. this conversation and people would say yes or no mm. and uh, but usually yes um, and that's how the interviews would come out cool. can I ask you guys to Sorry. move your chairs just a little bit closer together sure. yeah just, uh, not closer to Mike but if we can like get you oh, yeah. oh, almost I'm sorry I smell yeah. so much Brennan oh it's okay that's okay. <clears throat> <laughs> um, so most people said yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's. I mean, let's go to the beginning. Asking for it. Can you can you tell me a little bit what is what is this play? Sure. Um, it's a play that uh, I began working on when I was twenty one, and the Gameshi firing first happened, um, and uh, I was actually living in England at the time. But this news story. Uh, just brought about a lot of questions for me about my own relationship with desire and my own sort of sense of myself as a sexual being. And um, so I found this to be a really interesting like permission structure with which to have some really candid conversations with female friends mm -hmm. uh, and male friends, but initially female friends. And I would, so we were in England, no one knew who Gian Gameshi was or what the CBC was, right. but I would give them the context and I would say like, you know, this, this news story happened to really like famously progressive um, sort of PC guy um, is being brought up on sexual assault charges and the nature of the charges are acts of violence uh, during sex that weren't consented to mm. and I would kind of gauge people's reaction based on that yeah. and people had very different reactions um, like I came of age at the time of like internet porn and so lots of people that violence was a part of their <clears throat> sex life and they didn't think that like I didn't know that this stuff qualified as sexual assault I didn't huh. know non consented to violence during sex I just never really thought about it mm. and um, it made me look back on experiences that I'd had it made me really want to talk about this and I did and I got a really really like very stark range of responses and I was interested in sort of interrogating that and the silence around it and yeah and when did that become a play a play um when I finished school in 2015 I saw The Watershed it was one of the first shows that I saw back in Canada um and that's a documentary play uh, that Crows uh, did by Annabelle Sutar, and I thought this is the right form. It just sort of told the the macro story, and but through a very kind of personal lens. And I thought this would be, yeah, the right way to look at. And so, how long did it have? Like, uh, how many hours of conversations did you have before oh, I have you no started idea. <laughs> whittling it down? Do you know, like, how many people you talked to even? Over a hundred, like yeah. maybe a hundred and fifty. Lots of long, people. How long were those conversations on average? You know, there's some of them. One that made it into the play is exactly the like length of the length of the, a page, so uh -huh. like sixty seconds or something. <laughs> and then there's ones that were like, you know, we talked for hours, and I just like, you know, listened to it through afterwards and picked out parts, and yeah. And I should say it's constructed. It's not like. It's not pure verbatim. Not pure I, yeah, verbatim. it's edited okay. and yeah. stuff for meaning. Um, how did you approach these people? Like, how did you find them? And how did you get them to talk to you about these things? Yeah, I mean, the, like, it's interesting, like, the, the sort of asking for consent to talk about consent. Mm. Um, I, did mo I did mostly, I started with my inner circle, and then I, like, got farther and farther mm. out. Um, but when I was... 
pretty much all the conversations other than the ones with academics, um, I didn't ask their consent ahead of us hanging out. We were already hanging out and got on these topics and then I asked if they could be recorded. Did you, did you steer it towards those topics or were you just hanging out with the right academics and you were able to... Talk? No, sorry, the academic interviews, oh, okay, which okay. there, of which uh, there yeah, are yeah, in the play, okay, are okay. people that I emailed and said, you're an, you're an expert on this, I'd like to speak oh, to you. Okay, okay. But I'm saying apart from that, like the ones with like people that I know on a personal mm. level did mostly kind of arise out of, we were already having an interesting conversation and then I asked to record it. Yeah. When, when did you get involved in the, in the production? Uh, I guess about a... Maybe a year ago, a little like a little under a year ago. So um, Chris Abraham, who uh, who runs Crow's Theater, who's one of the sort of the co-producers behind this production, uh, contacted me saying, "Look, I have this this script uh, by super interesting script, sort of like super interesting young artist, uh, and I thought maybe it might be something that you would be interested in being involved in mm-hmm. with." So that's sort of how it came to me. And what what is it that 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 draws you to this particular subject? Uh, I mean, I, I I like the 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 project of the project, like in, like the the intent behind the project, which I think is to have, or to at least to to like uh, create the conditions for a very like complex and thorough investigation of consent to happen. Like that, to me, I think is a really uh, like a really good project to have, and mm-hmm. so I, it's very easy for me to get behind that. Uh, I think you know my work tends to often be about sex and about kind of difficult you know sort of the difficulties that come with sex in the body and so there's a kind of thematic thing but you know to be honest there were huge like I had a lot of reservations around directing the play um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm a guy I'm also gay mm-hmm. so kind of a play about heterosexual female male consent questions are kind of outside the realm of my really of my experience. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, I had some questions around whether I, it was appropriate for me to be directing this play. And certainly Ellie, you know, Ellie sort of really encouraged me that I think sort of maybe my outsiderness yes. from the dynamic she saw as a strength. Oh. Um, so, 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 yeah. Because initially, I mean, that's one of the things that I wondered about mm-hmm. when I saw, okay, so we're at this play, it's about, it's about consent and it's being directed by a man. So like, my, my first thing was like, huh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the right man, yes. like not just yeah, any yeah, dude, just for sure. You, you want like, to put, put like any dude in there. No, no. Um, in fact, most dudes. Maybe. No, of course. I would, I would agree with that. Most dudes probably don't have, shouldn't be like directing this play. But um, what was it, what did you see in, in Brendan that, in Brendan that you wanted to, that you thought that he was the right guy? Yeah. I mean, we, I mean, a lot. Um, I think that his, like, um, ability to be objective. I am not able to be objective at all with this material. These are my friends, yeah. this is my sisters, my life. Like I, I don't even. Brendan has pointed out so many things in the play that are there that I'm actually not even able to see because it's so close. But mm-hmm. then I know on some level they're there because I've chosen them. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't name them. Um, I mean, we had the most. It was absolutely the most exciting conversation that I had with anyone that I met with about the show. And, um, you know, you really spoke to, um, well, what Chris brought up the other night when we were speaking to the donors, like you're speaking about your relationship to shame and that being sort of um, like as someone who grew up like, like, you know, gay male sexuality and female sexuality are both sort of transgressive things. Mm -hmm. And so along with your desire is a lot of shame and those kind of, well, you've spoken really articulately about how those kind of become um, enmeshed Mm -hmm. and um, how do you separate the two? And is it possible to separate, to take away shame from desire without losing desire? And that was something that, um, that, you know, that was, that's your experience and that's what you described, but it um, seemed to ring very true of the play Mm -hmm. and um, yeah to be a really important sort of perspective on the play. Can you tell me about how the cast came together for this show? Yeah, I mean, luck. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> Great luck. Yeah, we were really lucky to get an amazing mm-hmm. group of people together. I mean, it really, there had been a prior workshop of the play of which um, Christine Horn had participated in, and this was before even I was a part of the yeah. project. So, so Christine had been sort of following the project for a while. Uh, and then we just sort of found sort of a couple of great actors. We just felt kind of, it's like creating a dynamic. And so mm-hmm. I think the two other actors sort of complete the dynamic very, mm-hmm. very well. Yeah. 
Nice. One of the things that I like to do on, on the podcast is talk to people about, um, you know, why do they do this theater thing? Like, what is it that draws them to it? What are they? What what keeps them in it? So, I was wondering if I could, if you'd both be interested in, in talking about like why theater. Goodness, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's such a big question. Um, do you remember? Do you remember, like just narrowing it down? Do you remember when you first realized that you were interested in theater? No, like, <laughs> it's it's been with me too long. Mm. Uh, no, um, I could make something up, but I mean, I think it's like. I think to bring it back to consent, like it's a kind of consent where like it's a permission structure where like in this room now I'm having conversations that like I don't have uh, mm -hmm. yeah. in other spaces in my life. And that's true of any, whether you're working on a play that's, that's your first play and it's about your life, mm -hmm. obviously that's going to be true. But even if you're working on like Chekhov with a great director, that's going to be true. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I like that, just mm -hmm. the sort of permission structure for connection um, where there wouldn't be otherwise. Um, yeah. Were you doing, did you do plays in, in school? Did you, did you write in school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah? Yeah. What did you, what did you do? Um, Remember? Like, as a kid kid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did or lots of musicals. Yeah? yeah, I did, like, I was always in a show. Mm. Um, musicals and then, um, and then a friend of mine who we were talking about today started a theater company in Windsor. And so then I did, who, and their sort of mandate was to do like weird, weird theater. And so I did a lot of weird theater in Windsor. And then I went to theater school in the UK. And then I worked a bit there while I was in school and just after. And then I came back here and have worked as an actor since. So just like whatever. Was there a point where you realized that it was like the thing that was going to be your life's work? Do you remember, like, was there ever any question? I think there probably just wasn't ever yeah. any question because I can't track, I can't like track mm. a moment or anything. No, mm. no, no. But it's evolved. Like my yeah. understanding of what I would do. I think I would want, I think I would have said when I was 10 that I was going to like do musicals and then mm. it evolved towards, you know, contemporary plays and yeah. classics and, and then writing became a part of that. I don't know. Uh, later in high school, mm. 17, 18. Yeah. Did you write for like the Sears festival or for your friends? Or no, you I didn't know? go, I didn't go to a high school that knew what the Sears oh, festival okay, was okay, or okay, had okay. anyone that wanted to do drama. So, <laughs> so no, um, no, but I, I had a really big experience when I was 17. Um, and I like, I lost a friend and there was a lot, lots of kind of around that, um, that I couldn't speak to someone about. And so I wrote this play and I remember it just really mattering a lot to me, but, mm. um, but obviously these events and these people mattered a lot to me. So I really wanted someone to read it and just objectively tell me if it was good. Right. Um, and I couldn't share it with people around me because it was obviously about my life. And so I applied to like a playwriting program and I ended up like, and I had to write something else because they needed two. And I ended up getting very like far in that process and, and being like, oh, okay, I should keep doing this then. So mm -hmm. when I when I went to acting school, which was what I really wanted to study, I was like, but I'll but I'll keep writing if I'm not mm -hmm. uh, studying playwriting. So yeah. And was there a point when you were at acting school mm -hmm. yeah, that, that that sort of writing became more of a thing, or do you find do you think that you're like equally actor and writer? I think I'm pretty equally yeah. both. Yeah, and I've done a lot more acting, so the writing mm -hmm. is newer. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, oh yes, yeah, so why theater? I mean, well, uh, well, my theater origin story is um, kind of I think helps ground sort of why theater for me. And so I, I didn't grow up in a family that went to the theater at all. It wasn't very much part of my my world. And uh, for some reason, when I was thirteen or twelve, my my mother enrolled me in some summer theater thing. For I'm from Montreal, and it was like kind of like a it was like the '80s, and there was like lots of like programs for young people to kind of get them off the street to do things mm -hmm. and so there was like this youth theater thing that my mother sent me to and basically it was like only run by young people it, like they gave us this old hangar in old in the old port when the old port was like really like just falling apart and so they just kind of gave like here's this massive uh hangar and you, you just do what you want. You mm -hmm. write the play, you direct the plays, you act the plays. And there were kind of, I kind of vaguely remember a couple of adults sort of like making sure that no one died. <laughs> but it was really like just like pretty like sort of punk rock, just like kind of do your own thing. And, and so that, that, sort of my, that was my introduction into the theater. And so it was like where, you know, I smoked my first cigarette, where I met my first gay people, where like, like I had my first blow job, like, like, like kind of like 
and and most importantly, <laughs> those are all important things. Yeah. But it was also the the space where, like, for the first time, I felt seen, mm. and I spoke a kind of truth. And so for me, that's what the theater was, was a place to kind of do naughty things, but also to speak your truth and to have it received. And so then I kind of learned that there was this whole other thing about the theater, which is like a kind of, you know, professionalism and history and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And then I, I kind of got into that as well. Um, and at a certain point was like, okay, I really, I want to do this like, like, like for really real, like I want to be real in my love for the theater. And so I got really into the sort of art part of it. But I've always, I think probably maintain this sort of original thing about the theater as being a place where you just sort of speak your truth and, and be seen. And, and sort of in my career, I sort of vacillate between really wanting to kind of participate in the kind of institutional sort of art practice and, and kind of kind of went very far down that road. And then other times I'm like, fuck, I don't give a shit about anything remotely professional. I'm really interested in just the, the, the human act of expression uh, and that the theater kind of allows. Mm -hmm. And and like I don't care if it's good or bad or if it's professional or not. I just really actually just want to support the purity of that. So, so um, yeah. Was there ever a point where you made the decision this is what you're going to do with your life that you realized it was a possibility? Yeah, I mean, like, I, when you're a yeah, kid, you, you don't you think, think it's think just that, like, real. This is yeah, you do. Grown ups yeah. are doctors and teachers and and other things that involve suits. Um, at what point did it yeah. become like a thing that you could do? do. You know that's interesting. I think I think I still kind of wrestle a bit with whether it's a, whether it's like a thing that's actually doable for a lifetime. Um, and certainly, I you know I've evolved professionally into kind of more of an arts manager and sort of artistic director, which is really primarily what I do. Um, but I think I think probably like to be completely honest, like the Muppets were <laughs> as someone like I didn't know any. My family didn't know artists yeah. like. For me, like my the only image that I had of what life in the theater was was like the Muppets, <laughs> and and then this like this youth theater thing. So I think that's kind of probably I don't know that that was the moment or that was the thing that made me think it was possible that like a group of kind of well I guess conceivably adults you know are engaged in this make believe thing and are kind of sort of living together making money. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the notion of a professional theater artist is still something that I uh, I, I wrestle a, with a bit as, as it actually being a possible thing and mm. whether um, you know depending on on your sort of background whether it's like you have kind of an availability of funds that allows you to kind of just have a, a theater career or whether actually all of us are engaged in doing a whole bunch of things and mm -hmm. we do theater when we can. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, now whether, you know, I think for me it's like the question around, is that a legitimate way of living or not? You know? And I think that, that there is sometimes in society, the idea that you're like a teacher and an actor is somehow, Oh, you're not like doing the real thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that, that I feel like, you know, I think we should, uh, really question that and just go like you know you're, you're doing your community theater thing and you're working in a factory fuck it you're doing theater yeah. mm -hmm. you know you're, you're a Stratford festival member fuck it you're doing theater yeah. you know it's funny because you know when I left theater school nobody ever wanted to admit to doing something else it was like a failure it was like like I'm an you know I'm an actor and I'm also not, not waiting tables was fine but it was like I'm an actor I'm also a dramaturg and stuff like that like I know people who were like stage managers and they're like, don't tell anybody that I know how to stage manage or like, <laughs> don't tell anybody that I also do lights or like any of the other things that we might do on the side because it was like, if word got out that they did something else, nobody would take them seriously as an actor. But now I see more people more proudly and more openly talk about, oh yeah, I'm an actor and I'm, I'm a writer and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a stage combat uh, person that like all the different things there are actors slash whatever were more accepted for that yeah I think it's a, a shift that I've seen in the last little while maybe indie theater has had something to do with that 
Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's an encouraging thing. I think yeah. there's maybe a lot of pressure on young people. You know, that kind of sh- the idea of like, sh- it's your sh- you should be ashamed that you have like a second job or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember an acting teacher telling me like, I never did anything but theater. Like, and it was like, kind of like, yeah. and that's why. You know, I'm like, well, you're fucking teaching right now. So, yeah. I, A, I don't believe you. Mm-hmm. And B, it was just kind of like, well, fuck you. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, don't, that, that's not, I don't think that should be a barometer, you know, no. for, for one's, yeah, passion and engagement and like the, the, the honesty of the pursuit, you know. Yeah. It's one of those difficult, difficult things to know, like, how do you balance, because sometimes it can seem like two different worlds, like, mm one job in the theater, Mm -hmm. they both demand a whole lot of you. Mm -hmm. Um, When you were, I haven't studied in in England and I don't know much about the theater scene in England. Ali, um, did you find when you were there that there was like, that anybody talked about having a foot in two worlds? No. Was it all like, this is what it's going to be? Yes, yes. And in fact, I was told, because I was writing, I was part of like a writer's group, um, and I wrote something that we did in our third year, and I was told like, you should use another name for writing than you do. Like, it was really, really strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the things that really drew me to coming back to Canada and to working here is that I, yeah, I want to do, I kind of want to do everything. I want to direct. Yeah. I want to dramaturg. I want to like produce. I want to write. I want to act. And um, I like that that scene is a strength. Like in the world, the Toronto that I've known, that scene mm-hmm. is like a, a strength uh, yeah. to wear many hats, not as a failing. I'm seeing it so much more and more like just over the last few years mm-hmm. as as fringe and other other festivals start to become more important to the theater career then people are more able to admit to those sorts of things yeah, yeah. sounds like sounds like the when you were in they were a little bit they were behind a little bit they're, yeah, they're, they yeah they have a lot more history like yeah. the weight of history mm-hmm. is much heavier there and mm-hmm. so the kind of theater that uh like that's written and that's produced there is different and not as exciting i think I want to. I want to ask a stupid man question mm, um, about great, about uh, uh, asking for it because yeah. I'm a stupid man. Um, in terms of because when I hear as a stupid man, when I hear that a play is about consent, I assume that it's not for me. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. that this is not a play. First off, because I'm stupid, I think <laughs> um, it's not a play that I need. That it, like I'm not going to be welcome there. Oh. And I feel like, and I wonder if like you know because I'm stupid that it's not speaking to me at all. Right, right. Um, how am I wrong? <laughs> As a stupid man, how yeah, am I wrong? Yeah, Well, we've had some interesting conversations, like, in the room about how, like, the play was workshopped publicly, and there was a really generous, like, feature written about it in The Globe uh, by Simon Holt. Um, and so people knew of the title and the fact that, like, oh, you wrote this play about consent without having seen it. Like, I've come, my whole year has been spent sort of, like, meeting people and then being like, oh, like, you wrote that, you wrote that play, right? And I absolutely am being, like, you know, struck with exactly, you know, the sort of assumptions that you just articulated. Mm. Um, you know, I think... The play wouldn't be very interesting if it was just me sort of standing on a stage wagging my finger being like, boys, you can't touch me unless I say this, 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 this. Like, that's right. not really what the what the play is about at all. We're having just much richer discussions about... Um, about desire and, and surrender and, like, the relationship of surrendering sexually with being sexually liberated mm-hmm. and how we kind of understand both of those things. Um, yeah, t- today at a, at a time when we're having like lots of conversations around um, protecting women and, and uh, how do women actually express what they want within that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and, you know, a lot of men are spoken to in the show. Most of my like person, I feel like such a like, I have lots of like friends that are men, but like most of my <laughs> friends actually are men. And um, I have much, I was raised by a single dad. I have much more access to men in my own life. And, um, you know, men were, there are lots of men in the play that represent ranges of perspectives and it's a, yeah, it's, um, I don't know what else to say. When when you were doing those interviews and you're talking to men, was there something that surprised you about the way that men look at consent? Um, I think I was disappointed. Pointed at one point, we got past this, but at one point, we were just talking about this today as well. Um, at one point, I felt like 
when I spoke to women, they would tell me things that surprised them and that they were ashamed of. And that's kind of what I was going for, like to really just like look at, 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 at shame. And, um, and men uh, were like less forthcoming and they were far more, I felt, giving me um, the sort of answer, I think making an assumption about what mm -hmm. the play was going to be mm -hmm. um, and giving me answers that just were less authentic. And, um, and so I think I became... I think I became attuned with how difficult it is for men to be vulnerable. Mm. Um, and yeah, so that was something that surprised me and that I learned. Do you think those men were telling you what they thought you wanted to hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think that's completely understandable. Like yeah. we're living in a, you know, in a very kind of like, you know, PC, like censorship kind of point. And yeah. it's, yeah, yeah. Were there were there any guys who were able to tell you that what you felt like was more uh, more authentic truth? Eventually, yeah. yeah. Not as many as women, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because we talk about you know the weight of cultural shame being on women mostly. Um, but but yeah, eventually. It's interesting because I think that I mean everybody always talks about how guys are always talking about sex, but guys aren't talking about sex. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Guys are guys have an extreme amount of. Uh, shame yeah. about sex, so I can imagine people not wanting to be completely honest about it. But, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, did, did women tell you anything that surprised you? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, ma like mainly it just surprised me that like I have I have sisters, I have really close girlfriends, and it just sort of surprised me that we hadn't had these conversations before. Mm. Um, that was the main thing that we that our the extent of our conversations about sex would be like. Oh, so you had sex with him? Yeah. How was it? Good. And like, that was kind of it. Huh. And to, it was the first time that I was being like, so what's good for you? What do you, what's good for you? What do you like? And yeah. And it surprised me. And it also, um, it surprised me how much people wanted to talk about it. Like I, hmm. I kind of felt like, oh, I don't want to pressure you into being in my consent play, but in the end people were really like welcoming of, of the huh. conversation. So yeah. So almost like they were waiting for a chance, somebody to give them like permission to, yeah, to, to yeah. tell the stories. Yeah. But it, it, something has something surprised you about about this play? A lot of things. I mean, surprise and and yeah. I mean, I think the the one of the surprises. You know, I'm I'm 42, so so I'm from a different generation, and I am surprised by the the lack of clarity that this younger generation has around sex. I think I had a kind of idea that, you know, growing up as a millennial, like that there was a level of conversation that was maybe a bit more honest. Mm -hmm. The kind of There's also just like an availability of information that I didn't have access to yeah. when I was coming of age sexually. So to kind of like listen to, pe to, to young people sort of attempt to articulate desire with the same sort of... Uh, like inarticulatedness was like a bit surprising to me. I thought yeah. I thought I thought this generation might be a bit more uh, able to identify what they wanted and then to communicate that. Yeah. Um, which you know, which, yeah, that surprised me. But I think indicates just a kind of aspect of the human condition mm. in relationship to sexuality. You know that. Um, and then I think the other thing that sort of surprised me is is. Um, the 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 that that you know I, I sort of came into this play thinking male sexuality was very different from female sexuality and thinking that gay sexuality was very different from het sexuality and there obviously are differences but but I am actually surprised by the actually how familiar like how some of the young women feel, how some of the young men feel. Like mm -hmm. it's like it's all actually quite familiar. Mm. Uh, which is, you know, I guess for me a bit of a like who kind of considers himself like kind of like a really sexually kind of liberated yeah. gay guy. A bit like, oh wow, I'm really relating to this like 22 year old straight dude. <laughs> like really relating to him, which yeah. is not at all what I would think. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's more about the human condition rather than yeah. uh, uh, sexuality. Yeah, and exactly, and that desire, and our relationship to desire, our relationship to our bodies, and then our relationship to other people's desires and bodies, mm. like really are 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 core are a core to our condition, mm. and and that that is just like that's just like a basic thing. 
you know, yeah. that transcends generation, transcends gender, transcends sexual preference orientation. Mm-hmm. Like it, it really uh, is something that really connects us. The, the problems of desire and the body. Mm-hmm. You know. Are there is there any something that in particular that you hope that people take away after seeing asking for it? Um, I think just like an appreciation and an understanding of complexity and a willingness to. Um, to sit in complexity in all its discomfort. Um, I would like, this place feels quite exposing of me and I've been really freaked out and (laughs) yeah. And I've been thinking like, so why am I putting myself through this sometimes? Because the idea of saying some of this stuff on in the room is already kind of like shameful. And there's parts that I can't get through without like laughing. And, um, and, but I do think that, um, what am I trying to say? I I do think that if that can like liberate people out of their own, encourage people towards like uncomfortable conversations and sitting in the discomfort and the complexity and the truth and that, then that's, that would be a worthy takeaway. Are you hoping for like people having conversations after they leave? I was thinking like conversations after they leave, Yeah. great sex after the conversation maybe. Both, either or, or both. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, totally. Brendan, is there something that you, yeah, you I think I think great <laughs> sex is definitely the goal of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think absolutely. I think I think the you know, whether it's you go with your partner and uh, uh, I don't know if great sex what that means, but op- <laughs> more openness, I think that's great. I think if you go with a friend and you're able to kind of just talk some shit out with your friend, which then allows you to just be a bit more open in your sex life, that's great. I think it's an awesome play to go with your kid. Mm, you know, oh, okay. like I think mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. it's a great like just a great way to just because it just puts it it so successfully puts out a whole slew of questions on the yeah. table in a really authentic way that I think it's a really great I think it's a really great play to see with like your your, your son or your daughter. I hadn't even considered uh, parents bringing children to it. Like I thought about. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know about. Children, <laughs> but like, like you're like your like your, your teenager. Your yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you can manage yeah. to drag your adolescent to the theater. The myth that like talking about consent is probably a really great, you know, absolutely thing to do. Mm-hmm. And it, that wasn't something that I considered. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, have you hoped for that too, Ellie? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and uh, and. And hopefully this gives it a a vocabulary the same way that I was able to say like, oh, the Gameshi story were these facts and can you respond to those? And in that I can understand, you know, something in my life, like, Mm -hmm. you know, a a kid can say to their parent, what did you think about this part? Or what did you think about that part? Like it's a vocabulary with which to have those conversations without needing to offer. I'm offering my personal stories so they don't need to offer theirs and they can still have conversations around these subjects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious about you. You talking just a, um, uh, just a few minutes ago about how exposed you feel with this play and, and how like you're having difficulty even getting through some things. Uh-huh. Um, you chose to do this play, I know. <laughs> and you like you've taken it from like writing to perform, like to, to rehearsal to performance. Um, is it only now that you're starting to feel like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this? Or have you always been feeling that way? I've always felt that way. I've yeah. always felt that way. And luckily I've had people around me who've sort of reminded me of the uh, the worthiness of like the investigation and the pursuit of the play. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Mm. But no, I've, al- I've always felt that. And uh, and it's good. I'm glad that I've been like supported and, and you know, and pushed along and yeah. like, and that I've obviously push myself along enough. What's your, I mean, how long do you have to, the play opens uh, when? October 6th. October yeah. 6th. So First you have a little bit of seventh, time. But we start previews seven. on the first. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and so you have a, 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 a couple weeks, maybe a week <laughs> or so to, to manage to, to get through this stuff. How does that feel? Like, you feel like you want to throw up or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. But it's also thrilling. Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, there is something about, like, telling something that's so personal that, that mm-hmm. does bring out the vomit in a performer. We're used to hiding behind, like, we're finding a truth, but also, like, not me. Yeah. I'm yeah. just performing this thing, and when it's your words, mm-hmm. it's it can be very... 
uh, like performing it is very terrifying. Mm -hmm. Is this your first time with this particular feeling? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I never thought I would write, even like when I began, began to understand myself as a writer, I never thought that I would write something where I was the named protagonist, named Ellie, playing Ellie. Yeah. And even when I started writing this project, mm -hmm. I thought like, I will edit myself out of these interviews and I will, you know, focus on the subjects, the people mm -hmm. that I'm speaking with. And uh, I don't really, I can leave myself out of it completely. And then it just, uh, it didn't serve the show. I needed to be in it. And then mm -hmm. it served the show more if I played me. And then it like, so I feel like each of the steps I've taken for a good reason. But yeah, it freaks me out. Did you ever try to write it without you in it? Yeah. 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 And we thought we talked about like casting another actor to play me as well. Mm. Um, yeah. So there are lots of conversations. And at what point, at what point did you decide, decide that you had to play you? Like in the spring, I think. In the spring. Yeah. I kind of put my foot down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it about, You're right. <laughs> what was it about Ellie playing Ellie that you thought was so important? Well, because I think the... the I guess in a way the sort of the integrity of the piece kind of rests on her vulnerability, if you will. And so, I mean, apart from the fact that she's like a very compelling actor and, and, and a, like an amazing presence and on stage and all that, I just felt that for the piece to work, like you kind of, she kind of had to put herself in, in that position mm -hmm. for, for it to, I think, resonate fully as a, as a piece of theater and, you know, so, so, yeah, you know, I, yeah, and it just seems, it would seem weird, it would just, yeah. it also just seemed bizarre, like, what, like, like, like some weird Woody Allen kind of thing, <laughs> where, like, you know, K Kenneth Branagh is obviously playing Woody Allen, but it's just like this, it's like, it's yeah. weird, it would just be weird. Mm. Yeah, lots of people who will see the show will know me, and know that I'm an actor, and that I wrote this play, and yeah, so it would have been weird. Been, no, that would have been weird. Yeah. 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 So everybody probably would afterward would be like, the show would end, they'd immediately look at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> and this way too, it's like a way of telling the audience, like, I'm okay with this. Mm. You know, like, um, I am, like, yeah, I'm okay with how exposed I am. Whereas if it's someone else, then yeah, you could worry for, yeah. you could worry for like the character, mm. as in me, as in the writer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What? Is there something you're most afraid of in performing this show? Yeah, there's sections. Like, mm. there's just sections that just make me wildly uh, uncomfortable. Is it shame? Is it what people yeah. think of you? Is it like? Is it? I um, think it's just the conditioning of shame yeah. of shame around like. I'd say female sexuality, but sexuality mm. generally, where it just feels extremely improper to say some of these things out loud. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. But then we have to interrogate, why does it feel improper? Yeah. Like, where, like, who is the silence around sexuality? What's it there for? Who is it serving? Is that um, part of the play, that, in, that investigation? Or is that something that you're discussing in the room and hopefully it will come out in a sort of a subtext? No, that's part of, of the play. Yeah. That's part of the yeah. play. And that's part of the idea around, like, including... Like, I don't actually find this very embarrassing, but I have at one point, like, I tell someone how many sexual partners that I've had mm. at that point. And people who read that are always like, oh my God, are you okay with that being in the play? And that's not actually one of the things that I think is more embarrassing, but, but, um, but it's made me go, yeah, like why, and why is that, like, is that number too high? Is it too low? Is it, is it embarrassing that I say it at all? Like, why is that a private? No, that's, a, that's actually an interesting, yeah. interesting thought. Like, yeah. what is it about a number mm -hmm. that, that we're supposed to be ashamed of? Yeah, and I'm using the number as like anything. Yeah. Like I feel embarrassed about this, and then I immediately question, well, why is that embarrassing? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a function of yeah the play. Is there important questions that that we should, like that we should be asking outside of the theater as well? Mm -hmm. Probably. So I, I hope that there like that there are some good conversations that come out of this. I hope so too. Are you guys on social media at all? Yeah. Websites? Yeah. I have Twitter. Um, should I say my Twitter thing? Yeah, say okay, well, it's at, the, of course, and then Ellie Mooner. So, Moon with an ER at the end. Mm, cool. Your mm. website or just, just a Twitter? Just, just a Twitter. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I kind of I gave up Twitter, um, but, but I have a website, uh, mrbrendanhealy.com. Nice. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you can reach out to me there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. It's been Thank a great you so much. Thank yeah. You. Thank you.